Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Meryl Richards, and I'm your moderator for today's live stream session. I'm also a director on the Food and Forest team here at Ceres. At Ceres, we work with influential investors and companies from around the world on critical sustainability issues, from the destruction of forests to the climate and water crisis and the protection of human rights throughout the global workforce. I wanna thank each of you and our speakers for participating in today's program. I know we're all living in really challenging times and I continue to be inspired by the ability of so many of the people that we work with to really remain focused on the important challenges we still face and on our shared long-term objectives. What we'll be talking about today is addressing environmental and social risks in cocoa supply chains. Now, if you're like me, and especially if you live in the US, uh, you may be looking forward to enjoying some chocolate treats during Halloween this year. Um, for me, chocolate, the darker, the better. The milk chocolate is, is not my thing. But the chocolate industry uses about 40% of all cocoa produced worldwide, and demand for cocoa is growing. Companies sourcing cocoa, however, are exposed to risks associated with climate change, child labor, and the expansion of cocoa production into protected forest reserves that are really critical for carbon storage and biodiversity. Because of this, cocoa supply chains are facing increased scrutiny and even potential regulation to eliminate illegal deforestation in both the EU and the US, which we'll hear about a bit more later. In today's session, we're gonna take a deeper look at some of these issues and introduce an investor brief on cocoa that Ceres launched earlier this year with our partners at Forest Trends that can serve as a resource for investors and companies looking to understand these risks. We'll also hear how Mars Wrigley is addressing these risks in their supply chain. So before we begin today's session, I have a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, please note that the session is being recorded. We'll, we'll be providing all participants and registrants with a link to the recording after the webinar is completed. If you have any questions, you'll, you will see a chat box in the bottom right hand corner of your Visibo um, screen. You may need to check you may need to click on the chat button at the top of your screen to make that chat box appear. Um, so you can type questions into the chat box throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to answer some of them at the end of the session. And finally, please note that there is a potential that due to global bandwidth issues, we may experience some connection challenges. Hopefully this won't happen. It seems like the, the um, global internet has adjusted to the, the work from home environment. Um, but if it does, please pause for about 30 seconds. We'll allow for bandwidth to readjust. And we thank you ahead of time for your patience if we do face some connection challenges. Now I'd, I'm really happy to introduce our speakers today. First is Nako Kobayashi, who's an associate on the food and forest team here at Ceres. In this role, she supports our research that informs investors about the key risks and opportunities related to commodity-driven deforestation across global supply chains. And she co-developed Ceres' recent cocoa commodity brief along with colleagues at Forest Trends. Next, we'll hear from Philip Rothrock, who's a program manager at Forest Trends Supply Chain Initiative. Philip is um, a program manager for the initiative, and he also uh, manages research projects tracking corporate commitments and progress towards addressing commodity-driven deforestation for hundreds of companies. Lastly, we'll hear from Kim Frankovich. Kim is a global vice president of Cocoa Sustainability at Mars Wrigley. She's responsible for developing the Cocoa Sustainability Strategy and implementation plans for 14 cocoa grow growing countries as part of Mars Cocoa for Generations, which is the company approach to protecting children, preserving forests, and increasing farmer income while creating a pathway for sustainable cocoa supply chains. So I will now turn it over to Nako. Thanks, Meryl, so much for the introduction, and thank you all so much for being here today. As Meryl mentioned, I'm the associate on the Food and Forest team here at Ceres, and together with our colleagues at For Forest Trends, including Philip, who will be speaking right after me, we developed the investor brief for cocoa supply chains, which I'll be speaking about today. I'll be drawing on some of the high-level findings from the brief um, just to be able to set the scene for the two other discussions, uh, two other presentations in the discussion to follow. However, if you are interested in learning more, please feel free to go to engagethechain.org slash coco to download the brief for free. And also feel free to uh, reach out to me directly. I'll have my email at the end of my slides. 
And on engagewithchain.org, you'll also find commodity briefs for other commodities that we've developed, including beef, soy, and palm oil, as well as other resources, uh, such as the Investor Guide to Deforestation and Climate Change. So without further ado, I'll just dive into the topic at hand, which is cocoa. Um, cocoa uh, is also sometimes called the cocoa or cacao bean, but it's not really so much a bean as the fermented and dried seed of the plant Theobroma cacao. And that's what you'll see here in this image. The cocoa supply chain from production to consumption is associated with some key issues that we'll dive deeper into shortly. These issues include human rights and the really closely related issues of poverty and child labor, which can sometimes include the worst forms of child labor, which include uh, forced migration, deforestation, which also drives the loss of biodiversity, um, and especially in cocoa growing regions, the risks are expansion into protected forest reserves and also climate change and the effects climate change are uh, predicted to have on the future viability of current cocoa growing regions. And here it's really important to note that on the global level, deforestation is a major driver of climate change as well. And as you'll quickly see throughout all of our presentations today that these issues are really closely linked, uh, which presents a lot of challenges, but also many opportunities since if you're able to mitigate one of these issues, you might be able to begin mitigating some of the other ones at the same time. And these issues um, affect companies all along co cocoa supply chains. And um, if left unaddressed, these issues can definitely become material financial risks for both the cocoa sourcing companies and their investors. Um, and this can happen all along the supply chain. And um, what you see here is definitely not a comprehensive list of all the different risks, but just to cite a few examples, uh, companies that are uh, upstream in the supply chain uh, that supply cocoa to the downstream manufacturers, uh, such as traders, may be faced with operational risks regarding uh, the physical effects that climate change is expected to have on cocoa growing regions. And this can threaten the long-term supply chain stability, especially in areas where uh, substantial resources have already gone into building up infrastructure or relationships. As well as Meryl um, alluded to, there are ongoing discussions uh, that expose companies to regulatory and litigation risk. This includes conversation in both the EU and the US um, about litigation that might penalize production or sourcing of deforestation linked products, as well as the ongoing conversations in the EU about environmental and human rights due diligence. These other risks um, have led many downstream manufacturers to begin uh, becoming a lot more aware of these issues, and um, they have started to implement policies for their suppliers uh, related to deforestation and human rights in particular. And so traders and other upstream companies may be faced with the loss of contracts and other market risks if they're unable to take the preemptive, me preemptive measures necessary to comply. And from the investor standpoint, uh, an investor's portfolio may be exposed to cocoa, not just through the holdings that an investor might have in cocoa, uh, chocolate confectionery companies, which is probably the first thing uh, most people think of, but also via the food and staples retailing um, and also restaurants that might be sourcing uh, chocolate and other cocoa related ingredients. And it's also important to note that cocoa butter is used by a lot of cosmetic and other companies to create uh, personal care products. And in terms of the cocoa supply chains themselves, there are many potential leverage points in order to uh, mitigate some of the risks and issues that I've mentioned. And uh, investors are most likely to interface with companies in the latter three parts of this uh, supply chain that you see here. So um, the processing, transport, trade, distribution, manufacturing, retail, and consumption. These are all processes that tend to happen on developed markets. So uh, once cocoa is exported, uh, the processing of cocoa most often happens um, in developed markets by companies that are listed um, in EU and US. And um, this is where most of the value is added to the cocoa products, but also where a lot of the leverage points are for engagement by investors. 
While most of the world's cocoa is consumed in developed markets, um, it's important to note that uh, most of the world's cocoa is grown um, in developing markets. And in fact, two thirds of all cocoa is produced in West Africa. And even in West Africa, really, it's these two key countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, that are producing two thirds of all of the world's cocoa. So um, this is important to note because if a company is sourcing cocoa, they're most likely sourcing cocoa from these two key countries uh, that are associated with a lot of the risks that I mentioned. However, beyond these two countries, it's also important to note that companies may be sourcing uh, cocoa, although at smaller volumes from these other countries you see here, and also countries like Brazil, which is not in this chart. And the other countries that cocoa is often sourced from are also associated with a lot of the key risks. So engagement is needed across all regions that cocoa is grown in. And a lot of these risks that I've mentioned and the issues that Philip will dive deeper into um, in his presentation really kind of stem from the on the ground realities of the farmers. So 90% of all cocoa farmers are smallholders. And what this means is that many farmers are growing cocoa on less than two hectares of land. So to put this all in perspective, in 2018, the average cocoa yield for farmers in Cote d'Ivoire was 490 kilograms per hectare. At less than two hectares per farmer, and at an average price in 2018 of $2.30 per kilogram, a lot of these farmers may have been making just 2200 dollars a year. And it's important to note that these are just estimates. So the actual farmer may be making much less um, than even $2,200 per year. And it's important to note that these farmers rely on cocoa as their main source of income. So as you might imagine, at this level of income, it becomes a lot harder for many farmers to think um, about the long term farm productivity. And instead, they are more concerned with the short term outcomes. However, this presents a lot of challenges because cocoa itself is a long-term play. Cocoa trees take around three to five years to get established, and after that, they can uh, produce cocoa for 20 to 30 years. However, older trees are more likely to become diseased. Um, this can affect yield and quality. Um, in addition, post-harvest activities and the drying and fermentation processes are very manual labor-intensive, and this all um, affects the quality of the cocoa beans. And with the low yield and the low prices farmers see from their cocoa beans, uh, their livelihoods are greatly impacted. And this can uh, make a lot of farmers rely more on short-term solutions to increasing cocoa yields, such as expanding their, uh, their cocoa production into protected forests, like I mentioned, uh, which drives deforestation, as well as relying on child labor either uh, from their own families or in the worst cases, relying on child labor through forced migration, which is uh, definitely an issue in this supply chain. And this kind of traps these farmers into this vicious cycle where they're unable to get out of the cycle of poverty and the practices that may follow. So I'm hoping that this gave you a really good uh, high level overview of the supply chains um, and good context for Philip and Kim to dive deeper into. Shortly, Philip will discuss more about these risks and uh, kind of a high level overview of what companies are doing. And Kim will take a deep dive into some of the ways that Mars is trying to address these issues. So with that, I will hand it off to Philip. But um, as I mentioned, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Naka. Good morning, everyone. So over the last few years, media coverage of the top two cocoa producing countries in the world, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, have shown concerning increase, increases both in deforestation and in the percentage of child laborers that are engaging in dangerous cocoa production activities. So meanwhile, climate change is projected to shrink cocoa production areas by 9% worldwide by 2015 or 2050, and to increase the prevalence of diseases and pests, which already cause up to 40% of current cocoa production losses, which begs the question 
Um, when investing in cocoa and chocolate companies, is it a trick or is it a treat? Well, when these kind of scary industry-wide challenges remain hidden, they can present serious operational, market, reputational, and regulatory risks for companies and their investors. So today, based on our joint research with Ceres, I'll be speaking on what actions uh, cocoa and chocolate companies are taking, are taking to sweeten the deal for investors. Forest Trends Supply Chain Initiative has already has half a decade's worth of experience tracking hundreds of companies for their corporate commitments and progress in reducing deforestation from other key commodity supply chains. And now we cover cocoa. So the three main areas of, of leadership I'll cover are uh, setting, implementing, and enforcing uh, slash verifying commitments. This is timely given that Halloween is just around the corner and consumers and investors are increasingly waking up to the darker side of chocolate. So given deforestation concerns, particularly in West Africa, the market has an opportunity to become more responsible with concerted leadership from both the private and public sectors. Um, so first, in setting commitments. Um, in an unprecedented move in 2017, uh, the industry acted when 37 cocoa and chocolate uh, companies representing 85% of uh, global uh, cocoa usage, part uh, cocoa and chocolate usage, partnered with uh, the governments of Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and more recently Colombia in collectively committing to ending cocoa-driven deforestation, as well as promoting farmer livelihoods and social engagement. Uh, since since then, there's been a large uptick in the worldwide. Uh, corporate cocoa and chocolate commitments. Um, according to the CFI, most signatory companies have developed action plans for 2018 to 2022 for both uh, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. But how can investors understand how these commitments boost broader business strategy? One key signal is when companies have board oversight over sustainability issues like deforestation and human rights, which can be critical for evaluating performance and competitive opportunities, which is why investors will be interested to find a growing minority of cocoa and chocolate companies that are influential in US markets now require board approval for sustainability activities and performance. Furthermore, when faced with systemic global environmental and social risks from cocoa production, investors can also look to whether companies have commitments that apply to all their brands, suppliers, and supply chains, as well as upholding deforest deforestation-free standards and setting meaningful de deadlines. Many companies still apply regional commitment focuses of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, as was specified under the Cocoa and Forest Initiative, yet only a handful of leading cocoa and chocolate companies influential in the U.S. market have set global time-bound deforestation-free uh, commitments. So uh, there's a, implementing commitments can be difficult for many companies because compliance um, in many cases requires the action of many, uh, many smallholders, as you can see here. Um, with this in mind, when companies are faced with ensuring compliance across so many suppliers, how can investors know trick from treat? Well, when assessing corporate actions. Well, when implementing commodity commitments, companies tend to focus on three areas of action. So the first is traceability and supply chain mapping. When investors want to assess the environmental and social risks around the sources of production for their portfolio companies, it's vital for companies to know where their volumes come from, which direct and indirect suppliers are involved. But because smallholders produce such a vast majority of the cocoa, it can be challenging for cocoa producers and traders, let alone chocolate manufacturers and retailers, to trace back their volumes to the origin, i.e. to the farming group or um, farm. Oh, uh, so just last month, one of the top three largest cocoa traders, Olam, which sells 
roughly 12% of the world's cocoa, reported meeting its global goal of being able to trace 100% of its cocoa back to the farm level. Pro progress like this among key suppliers helps explain why a growing minority of influential cocoa and chocolate companies in the US markets have been able to trace at least a portion of their volumes back to the farm. In addition to identifying all direct and indirect suppliers, another big step for companies can be to work with smallholders to map the coordinates of each farm, as, as Mars is doing. Um, securing land tenure, too, can boost productivity and social outcomes. Already, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative reported its members and mass mapped 1 million farms within their supply chains. So the next area to focus on is standards implementation and verification. We find that only a minority of cocoa and chocolate companies influential in US markets disclose the percentage of compliant volumes. And many of these companies are relying on certifications, mostly Rainforest Alliance and Fair Trade to achieve their commitments. <laughs> but their, effective, their effectiveness may be limited due to weaknesses in auditing, monitoring, and other issues. As a consequence, a minority of companies are supplementing these efforts by developing satellite monitoring capabilities to track land use changes and working to map their smallholder suppliers. Often companies will rely on Global Forest Watch, um, Pro, or some other privately developed source. So, uh, or privately developed service. So then um, also uh, investors can look for whether companies are providing incentives for compliance. Many smallholders are poor and receive only six, around 6% 6 of the financial value of a chocolate bar as compared with other actors, which can make it difficult for them to comply. That's why around half of the influential companies that we looked at that are active in US markets have provided some form of financial and or technical assistance to suppliers, including Mars. The Cocoa and Forest Initiative reports that 1 million farmers have already been trained in good agricultural practices by their members, for example. So the next uh, area to look at is um, enforcement and verification. So, um, a handful of leading companies have developed clear non-compliance policies with time-bound action plans for cases of supplier non-compliance, which can serve as a signal to investors that they are taking these risks seriously. Reporting on follow-through of these commitments remains rare among influential companies active in U.S. markets. Grievance mechanisms too can also um, be important. So even when companies invest large amounts of money into implementing their commitments, there can still be rec rec reputational risks posed by poor company um, uh, by poor performance. So it may be seem counterintuitive, but grievance mechanisms offer companies with an opportunity for advanced warning for emerging environmental and social problems when they are open to all uh, stakeholders. And increasingly, these types of complaints are being aggregated and disseminated by researchers, campaigns, and external tracking systems like, say, the COCO and accountability map. Um, so a majority of influential COCO and chocolate companies active in US markets are employing them, though their effectiveness depends on their availability to all stakeholders you know, clear outlines for processes for responding to claims and consistent tracking of progress and resolu um, and progress towards resolution. Um, so looking ahead, there's upcoming legislation to restrict uh, imports of commodities tied to deforestation in key consumer markets like the EU, UK, and even the US, which can make it harder for laggards to hide and make it easier for leaders to shine. Um, corporate leadership and commitment, action and enforcement can serve as a business opportunity to prepare for regu these regulatory risks. Um, companies just go farther together. So working through public-private partnerships um, can provide a sweet opportunity to work through these systemic and interconnected environmental issues. Um, and so the spread of the coronavirus has sadly forced many companies to reassess the risk from trick, trick or treating. Um, so for investors, COVID highlights the importance of valuing um, environmental, social, and governments risks when engaging companies in the portfolio. Not all investments in cocoa and chocolate uh, portfolio companies may be as sweet 
Um, and so there there's needs uh, careful consideration. So happy trick-or-treating. Uh, thanks everyone. And now I'll turn it over to Kim Frankovich from Mars. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today and, and hearing more about our um, efforts in this important, uh, uh, lovely treat, uh, cocoa and chocolate. So just um, a little bit about Mars, um, for those that um, may not know us, um, the, we're about uh, 125,000 associates that are worldwide. Um, we have quite a global footprint. We're in 80 uh, different countries with operations. Uh, we have four primary businesses there at the bottom of the slide. Um, me, I'm representing the Mars Wrigley in our confectionery, chocolate and confectionery segment. Uh, we also have a, a large footprint with Mars Pet Care. Um, and you'll see some of the um, brands there that, that you may be familiar with, which is uh, Whiskas and, and Pedigree. Uh, we also have a food business and a, a Mars Edge business, which is some of the, the cutting edge uh, work that we're doing um, in consumer trends. So um, the, I'll start first with um, on the left hand side there, that, which is our purpose, which is the world we want today. Um, or I'm sorry, the world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. And it's a cornerstone and foundation for where we need to go. Um, and a recognition that um, over our 100 year journey, um, what got us here today is not going to get us where we need to be tomorrow um, to address the um, si significant issues around climate change, um, respect for human rights in our supply chain, and um, ensuring that those um, in our supply chain um, have the ability to make a decent standard of living. How we've grounded ourselves around um, addressing these issues as a, a global business is around our sustainable and a generation plan. Um, we launched this uh, in 2017. However, it was not our first foray into uh, sustainability. Mars in 2010 um, set climate-based um, targets around greenhouse gas um, emissions. Um, and back in that time, they were one of the few companies that was outspoken and speaking about climate science. Our program and our approach is grounded in science um, and we believe in the climate science. Uh, so that is the, the, the starting point for us. We have three um, pillars, um, three, three focus areas in sustainability that I've highlighted here, healthy planet, thriving people um, and nourishing well-being. They are interconnected. Where I'm gonna speak about today is on the healthy planet and thriving people. Um, when we set our commitments back in 2010 around our operations, they were centered around um, our factories, right? And scope one emissions. And what we quickly realized is um, not of all of our emissions were sitting in our factories, um, which is why we're heavily focused on climate action um, and addressing um, uh, lowering uh, greenhouse gas emissions, not only in our own operations, but in our in our supply chains. And we focus there around um, uh, a commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in our extended supply chain by 67%. Uh, cocoa is the big driver of that, as, as you heard from um, Nako and Philip. Um, we also um, have land management and land use impact areas um, and water. Those are the three primary healthy planet and plus circular packaging. So we've recently announced um, um, goals and a plan around um, getting to our commitments in packaging. On the thriving people side, um, we've focused on three primary issues. Again, these are the impacts that are most salient to our business. Um, the one there at the top around increasing income to ensure that all of those in our extended supply chain um, have the opportunity and can maintain a decent standard of living, that everyone in our supply chains, right, human rights are being respected. And then the third one there around unlocking opportunities for women. We've put this in thriving people, but it's very much a cross cutting um, and, and influences and programs, uh, our, our thematic pro programs and how we address the, the healthy planet. 
Uh, so, and on nourishing well-being, those are our areas around recipe, sugar, um, health and well-being, um, and and um, we have more on our website, and we can do another webinar on those. But I'll focus on the other the other two tranches. So, with respect to how what this means for cocoa, so Mars's approach is global. These are commitments that we've set across our entire business. Um, if you recall, the, the four businesses that were at the bottom of the page, they all share a portion of achieving those targets. And for Mars Wrigley, the cocoa supply chain is a significant um, impact area. So we have a special uh, specialized program um, called Cocoa for Generations um, to address these salient issues. Uh, this was a program that uh, we shared publicly in 2018 um, and it was building upon the prior work that we had done. Uh, when we set the climate-based goal back in, in uh, 2010 around greenhouse gas um, targets, we also set goals around um, purchasing certified cocoa um, and utilizing certified cocoa as a way to meet our, our long-term commitments. Um, with the resetting of our sustainable and generation uh, plan and then sort of assessing that, how we were doing in cocoa, we realized that uh, we needed to do more and we needed to move beyond um, certification schemes. So what we did is we put in place two uh, pillars um, to approach this. The first there on the left is Responsible Cocoa Today, which are time-bound commitments. They are across all of our sourcing areas um, and they're focused on three priority areas, protecting children, preserving forests, which is our deforestation-free commitment, and then improving farmer income. The second pillar, Sustainable Cocoa Tomorrow, are uh, pilot innovation programs where we are going deeper. They're where we work with the responsible cocoa groups um, that um, are ready to go on a journey to um, much higher productivity, farm investment, um, to invest in new cocoa trees, and also diversified income. I highlight the Empower Women in Communities, but that also cross cuts into our Responsible Cocoa program as well. I'm gonna focus here today on the Responsible Cocoa piece um, and drill just a little bit deeper on how we're approaching that. So here are our priorities. Um, each one of these, as I mentioned, is across our entire uh, global sourcing. Um, on the left there, Protect Children, there's a few acronyms here on the the slide, the, the CLMRS is child labor monitoring and remediation systems. We committed in 2018 to put in place 100% um, coverage for any sourcing area where there was hazardous child labor risk. Um, we've committed to do that by 2025. Um, and we've committed that um, to do that, we have a protect children action plan that we've published. Um, I'll show a bit about that in just a minute. Um, on our website that shows how we will get there across those sourcing regions. Um, critical to that are programs that we've, um, we're embedding in the communities around empowering women um, and a partnership that we have with CARE um, to extend uh, village savings loans, financial literacy across um, the communities in which we source from. And we've also committed to um, certain platforms and uh, around um, improving quality, education quality, um, particularly in, in Cote d'Ivoire. The middle uh, uh, pillar there on preserving forests, this is our deforestation free um, commitment. Um, it's underpinned as, as Philip um, highlighted around traceability, which is for us, traceability means going back to the farms where the cocoa is sourced from and then tracing it through. And I have a slide that'll share a little bit more about how that looks um, and what makes why this makes it is a bit complicated. Uh, Philip also mentioned satellite monitoring systems. So one of the, the features of the Cocoa and Forest Initiative was for uh, the 37 companies and the governments to agree on the satellite monitoring and approach. That's one of the areas where we're focused on. It's a bit stalled when you look at um, the timings on some of these. Um, when you're dealing with 37 companies and two governments trying to get all rowing in the same way at the same time, um, uh, things have different fits and starts, but that's one of the, the, the aims of that um, initiative. But separately, we're not waiting. Um, we are putting in place, uh, we have satellite monitoring across um, our other raw materials, and that will be extended to COCO as well. Um, and highlighted there are the public-private partnerships. 
um, that that uh, Philip mentioned around the Cocoa and Forest Initiative. We're also a part of the World Cocoa Foundation and have um, uh, partnerships that sit within that as well. Um, and have recently joined uh, the uh, Jacobs Foundation, um, again, um, public-private partnership to address um, uh, child labor um, and education quality. The third one, premiums. Um, this is around ensuring that the additional premiums that we pay uh, for farmers for responsible cocoa actually reaches them. Uh, the, these are largely cash-based um, societies that don't have mobile money, mobile banking, they are unbanked. Um, many do not have bank accounts. And so this is uh, extremely critical and important um, that these systems be put in place so that we can not only trace, but we can act faster um, in terms of when uh, these communities and farmers are in need, such as when uh, what we're experiencing in COVID. So I mentioned um, the Protecting Children Action Plan. These are in the Cocoa and Forest Action Plan, which um, Philip highlighted. These were, um, they lay out um, in, in detail how we intend to get there um, around the different origins. Um, and they put time bound commitments and reporting requirements. Um, they're uh, published on our website. Um, as is all of the um, annual reporting and our progress against them. The Protecting Children Action Plan is um, has a uh, four different areas that are are critical. I mentioned one was the um, uh, child labor and monitoring systems in place, um, and then the the remediation of cases that are found. Um, within that is also the women um, and um, community empowerment program I mentioned about um, with care. We've also invested in the Jacobs Foundation, which is this access to quality education. And all of these are designed to be interconnected within the sourcing communities um, to help increase income for the, the cocoa farming families. The Cocoa and Forest Action Plan, um, right now we have for Cote d'Ivoire and, and Ghana, um, and we um, are underway with a plan in Indonesia uh, that will be shared later this year, uh, as well as uh, next year, uh, Brazil, Cameroon, Nigeria. Um, so you can see that one by one, we're going country by country. Um, we've done risk assessments um, in both of these areas at the, at the country level um, with our expert partners, um, uh, Verite uh, International on the human rights and Conservation International on the deforestation piece. And I encourage folks um, to ask companies if they have done the risk assessments and whether they've asked for their suppliers to do risk assessments. We can do it at a global level, but at the supplier level, we really need um, those that are closest to actually be doing deeper risk assessments in their sourcing supply chains. And we do require that as part of our responsible cocoa program. So I promised a little bit about the traceability piece. Um, this is a generic um, uh, picture we put together to try to uh, highlight for those that aren't familiar with the cocoa supply chain, um, how many steps there are before it actually reaches a product on the shelves. And here on the, the first point is obviously the harvest um, at the farm. They, these are, small farms, they work in a aggregated method with a collector that will come around on bikes um, or in small trucks and they gather the cocoa um, from these farmers. Um, oftentimes these are collectors um, are connected with uh, co-ops or farmer groups. This is where the certification schemes have come in in terms of certifying and organizing um, groups so that they can collectively gather the cocoa and that standards can be put in place that go all the way back to the farm. From there, um, the here is the international cocoa trader or processor. So these folks are in origin, they're in the country and they're buying from the local groups and they're buying from the local um, uh, uh, supply chain there. Um, sometimes we call it the indirect supply chain the international exporters, largely most of them have programs on the ground um, and are working directly with farmers in these different groups. The indirect supply are those that are local um, traders um, that uh, may not have 
groups have not organized them, but they fulfill a really important function, which is gathering cocoa from very extended areas. And then it makes its way down. So um, Philip or, or Nako mentioned about the processing. There actually is processing in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. We, there's also processing in Indonesia. Um, that gets pro some of that cocoa uh, gets processed in country and then it's exported. So here it'll make its way. There's beans that get exported. There's liquor, uh, cocoa, butter, and powder. And as it makes its way um, through this chain, through quality control, and then ultimately into the product that we, we buy and receive at the factory, there's many steps. So trying to trace this along the supply chain can be quite difficult. Um, that's why you need management systems. Um, you need partners that share your goals um, and share your commitments and um, sign up to the, the same things that, that um, you want them to be doing. Um, and for us, um, we are tracing, as I mentioned, back to this first point of purchase. And just a little bit, this, I, I was hoping to have a little bit of a video, but, but couldn't make it work. But part of the transparency journey is sharing, um, again, where we source our cocoa. We shared last year the, the origin countries we source from, all of the suppliers' names. And this year, we went a step further to share the farmer group. So there's an intermediate step, which is you trace back to the farmer group, and then there are thousands of farmers within those groups. And those farmers are now being mapped, uh, the boundaries being mapped. Um, and so what we did is we shared the uh, names you can click on. It's an interactive map. And you can click down and keep clicking down. And what you'll find here, this, these are the names of the farmer groups, the total number of farmers, and then who the certification body is. So um, many folks um, um, are now starting to publish these maps uh, and share the, the, their, their journey to traceability and transparency. Um, one of the key things for us is that as we go forward is what is the change that that drives and what is the accountability that it drives? Um, it's um, not for the faint of heart, um, but it is one that for anybody that is buying cocoa or cocoa products, they need to be asking um, their companies and their sourcing providers what they're doing in this space. So with that, I will um, um, say a big thank you and also highlight that today is International Day of Rural Women. Um, many of you may be surprised, but globally, one in three women um, are actually employed in agriculture. Um, women are often not uh, recognized as farmers um, in many of the supply chains, including cocoa. They are doing a substantial amount of the work, but they aren't viewed. Um, they themselves aren't viewed as farmers, um, nor does the outside world view them as farmers, but they're very much um, a part uh, in farming. And um, another um, uh, a little factoid is around uh, water collection. Many of these communities do not have um, water piped into the home. And so the women and girls are often the ones that are tapped to collect that for, for the um, household. So a uh, little bit, thank, a big shout out to uh, the women that um, work on farms and support families. And with that, I will turn it back over to uh, Nico. Thank you so much, Kim. And, and thank you to Nako and to Philip as well. Wonderful presentation, really rich information. We have about 15 minutes or so, 17 minutes exactly, uh, for some questions. So we'll start with some that came in from folks as they registered for this session, and then we'll go to some of the ones that are coming in live now. Um, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question of our presenters today, you can click on the chat box at the top of your screen, and then you'll see the chat box appear in the bottom right-hand corner, and you can enter your questions there. Um, so first to start with, I have a question for Kim, which is that uh, Mars aims to source 100% deforestation-free cocoa by 2025, and you, you talked a little bit about your plan there. Um, and you've also committed to sourcing cocoa that is traceable from the farmer to the first point of purchase. And you, you talked in depth about what you're doing there, which is uh, fantastic. Can you, can you talk a little bit about how Mars is on track to meet those goals? And do you feel that, that you're on track? 
Sure. So um, uh, earlier this year, we published um, our three different tranches of, of how we, we, we track the traceability. Uh, at the farmer group level, we're a little bit over 50%. So that means we've got um, not only GPS location, that's what's published on our website, um, but those uh, farmers in those groups also have GPS points. Um, so we go a step further and we're about 30%, 33% of our global supply is traced down to now what we call the farm boundary. We, it's important to note that people don't describe traceability different. They, they, there's not a common definition of traceability. So one of the things is to get real clear with whoever you're asking, what do they mean by traceability? And so those, those are the two primary areas for us. Um, so we feel like we're on good pace. Um, COVID has, has put a little bit of wrinkle in it with um, people not able to go out into uh, the communities. It's impacted uh, a little bit of our delivery this year. Um, for sure, but we think we'll, we're on track to deliver. Um, but they're aggressive. All of these commitments are aggressive to do it at the scale that we need it. Um, we're not 5,000 farmers. They're, currently, we estimate there's roughly 350,000 to 400,000 farmers. They're not static. Um, they change over time. Um, they may switch groups. A group may get decertified um, for a variety of reasons, and then you need to supplement that with a new group that meets your requirements and new farmers. So we expect that this is going to go up and down, right, um, over time as as we implement this. And the 100% is always the, the striving and the target, but it also highlights uh, for us and for others that you kind of have to go beyond 100%. Uh, because you're going to have a portion of your supply chain um, that may not meet your quality spec. There may be an issue that comes up in, in, in during the year and you, you've got to supplement it with something else. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question um, for Philip, which is in, in your research, you know, looking at the cocoa industry as a whole, what are some of the biggest um, barriers and sticking points across the industry in terms of making commitments and then implementing uh, the commitments? Yeah, I would say um, kind of, as I, as I mentioned, we do research on a variety of uh, commodities that drive deforestation. And I think cocoa is newer on the radar of, of companies, so making, First, making sure that, that, that companies that uh, have exposure are also addressing this in addition to the other commodities. Um, but I would also say that um, I want to pick up on a point that Kim mentioned that um, I think when companies demonstrate, you know, report on their approach to assessing and addressing risk, it's really, uh, they should be do. you know, they're, I'm not, we don't advocate one way or the other, but I think to get more detailed information such that companies can set the right commitments. It's helpful for companies to assess where are the kind of the, the, the problem points, where, 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 are the defor where is deforestation occurring? Um, you know, in the case of uh, cocoa, there's a huge risks around um, naturally protected areas that could be uh, under threat. And so I think companies that are demonstrating that they have a robust focus on that and that they're really engaging with their suppliers on these issues and and kind of I've heard and seen reference to companies really trying to get to know their suppliers and I think it's harder to do that when you have I mean there's obviously a lot of different suppliers to work with but the more you kind of dig deeper uh, the, the better it is and I think having showing board you know engaging the board on that I think can really help having a top-down kind of push on that and when we've looked at research, we we find that companies may mention board involvement, but it's rarely in relation to specific commodities. So we, it's good that if companies are really engaging on sustainability as a whole, so that it kind of uh, pressures you know all the divisions to kind of consider it. Great, thank you. So um, Nako. Uh, Philip talked a lot about some of the key areas for companies to address, to bringing it back to what investors can do in this case. What are some of the key questions that investors can and, and should ask companies during engagements that would help them better understand 
how the company is addressing key issues in the cocoa supply chain, such as, as in detail. Yeah, so definitely some of the key questions um, boil down to a lot of what's been already said, including, you know, what is the company doing to engage their suppliers, not only their direct suppliers, but really their indirect suppliers that we've, as we've mentioned throughout this webinar, the cocoa supply chain is very complex. And, you know, we ask, uh, as series, we encourage uh, investors to ask companies what they're doing um, beyond their direct suppliers for all the commodities that we engage on. But in particular for cocoa, the indirect supply chain is really key uh, as there's so many hands that cocoa beans pass through before it gets to the downstream manufacturers. And so the types of questions investors can ask is, you know, beyond their tier one direct suppliers, what is the company doing to engage indirect suppliers? What types of com uh, supplier non-compliance policies do they have? Do they help um, non-compliant suppliers return to compliance um, and th things of that nature? In addition, um, another uh, critical thing companies can be doing is to provide uh, their suppliers and indirect suppliers with incentives. And this could be either financial or technical. And I know I saw um, in the chat um, a question about premiums and what um, the types of premiums companies can pay. And premiums are definitely a uh, key part. And a lot of companies uh, use certifications like the UTS Rainforest Alliance certification, which has a premium component. However, in some of the ongoing research that Ceres is doing about uh, effective sub, uh, supplier incentive mechanisms, we found that premiums aren't always um, as effective in changing behavior on the ground. Because as I mentioned, the yields um, that farmers are seeing right now are very low, that if you're tacking on a premium per kilogram of cocoa bean, if the kilogram yield is already so low, then a premium can only go so far to effectively change behavior on the ground. And so it's really important that companies all along the supply chain are working to uh, support farmers by um, technical assistance as well. And also, as Kim mentioned, um, public-private partnerships and multi-stakeholder partnerships are very, very key in this supply chain because of the influence of the indirect supply chain. And so um, investors should also be asking what companies are doing beyond their own supply chain uh, to drive systemic change in the supply chain. Thanks, Naka. So that was a great segue to some of the questions that we have coming in. You've got some really excellent questions coming in in the chat. Um, so I'd like to turn to Kim. And the on the issue of premiums, we have a question about uh, how, what is the process used to implement the premium that Mars provides? And I'd love to hear more detail on your work uh, on ensuring that the premium actually reaches the farmer, because that is also you know, one of the key issues that, that we've heard with premiums. Yeah, um, very, great, great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, so for us um, in our responsible cocoa program, we go through our process. First of all, we have uh, our requirements that are laid out and that are shared with um, the suppliers on what we expect. And um, at the very beginning, it's coming up towards the end of the year, uh, going into the first part of the year and throughout, we ask for proposals. Um, so we ask for detailed proposals from each supplier in the origin that they are um, sourcing cocoa from, um, their plan, their plan for how they're going to deliver and implement um, our requirements on the ground. Um, it's a process of about four or five months of, of assessing their plan, seeing they were, where they were at from last year, um, and then um, asking for um, detailed costing on what each portion of the implementation um, costs, right? Um, and aligning on what that premium is being used for. And as Nako suggested, um, people get confused about the premium. I've, there's a cash premium that goes to the farmer. There's also what I would call, deem as an implementation premium, which is the cost to actually implement the program which is what we pay as part of the premium as well. Um, if you go back to the supply chain start chart and trying to put in those all of the systems along that way to ensure that the COCO meets your requirements, systems and investment is required. Um, and so for us, it's a very active engagement. Um, you know, for us, sustainability and sourcing are joined. Um, we work together um, with our uh, sourcing and our buying teams. Um, they are very involved in um, who gets what and also uh, whether they're meeting the requirements. 
Um, and so we align with the suppliers on what that premium is. And um, over the course of the last few years, have been more focused on how much, how can we get more down to the farmer. Um, there is a piece of that, which is they need money to invest to um, deal with pest and disease, but also to put in new trees, right? Um, and so a portion of that we would like to see being used for that, but it doesn't always work that way. Some countries limit actual distribution of planting materials. So there's a, there's a variety of issues that come into play. And I would also say that with premiums, um, so then uh, you also, different countries have different customs. Um, in some portions of the world, um, the farmers will actually ask for inputs um, or in-kind things in, to, sup to supplement rather than the cash premium. So discounts on different things. So this idea that there's a one size fits all, um, particularly across the scale that we need, um, isn't so true. And each supplier implements a different way. So it's really important for us to understand how they're implementing it and then agreeing with what them on what that implementation plan and how that premium spent. A bit on the financial traceability piece, this is one where it differs origin by origin on whether um, there is even access to mobile money, right? In that financial transparency piece. Um, right now we have about um, 18%, a very small amount that we can actually track through a financial system. Um, there is such a great need um, uh, with respect to technology providers and um, mobile providers, internet providers in these rural communities. It's not just a COCO um, issue. We need a collective call to action to actually get people services in the rural communities. And I would hope that um, I have been hoping and calling um, on many um, through COVID to make it happen faster. Um, but that there, there's infrastructure that has to be built. Um, and so we'll, we'll, as we go along, we'll share what we're doing. Uh, some of the suppliers are, are advanced and have are only, are only paying via mobile money. Um, we also in our supply chain in Indonesia have, have um, put in programs and tested that out and we'll be rolling and scaling it out. So uh, a lot more to come on that, but the key is to put the systems in place, but then the farmers also have to want it. So there's a piece of that behavior change. They're used to cash, they like cash, um, and getting them to trust new systems, new actors, it takes time. Um, so a lot of this is about the behavior change piece. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, incredible complexity in the supply chain, and, and we'll, we'll watch the space for what, what Mars is doing moving forward. Um, we've got a time for maybe one more question. And we had a question about um, the effects of climate change and what companies may be doing to help mitigate and adapt against the upcoming effects of climate change. So uh, I, this could be another question for Kim. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot with so many, yeah. um, but we've got some, some really interesting questions. So if you want to yeah. take a minutes talking about that. Absolutely. This is a significant um, one for us. We actually have research centers around the world um, in Indonesia, in Brazil, um, and also at the UC Davis um, that are focused on um, breeding the most um, salient new cocoa plants that can actually help adapt to climate change. Um, and we do a lot of research um, on the ground um, at, at our uh, research centers around this. We also work with farmers in terms of training um, through uh, cocoa doctors, where you, it's kind of a you train up the 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 lead um, really progressive farmers in the area, and then they become an extension service and their own service provider. There, uh, in terms of that climate change issue, um, also pest and disease. So we do a lot of work around integrated pest management, and we have a team that 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 um, works on how uh, to address uh, uh, witch's broom, uh, CSSV, all the different um, pests and disease, um, and also try to um, cultivate plants that will um, in the future, you know, not be able, they will um, be repellents, right? So the pests won't, won't attack the tree, but a lot to be done and a lot of work um, that happens and goes on. And then once you find the, the relevant um, tree, you have to have a distribution mechanism. So we also fund nurseries 
Um, and we also fund um, through the suppliers, the distribution of um, new cocoa um, trees and varietals. Thanks so much, Kim. Nako, I think you had a, a quick note to add about this and then we'll wrap up. Sure, yeah. So in the cocoa commodity brief, uh, we do mention some of the other uh, supply chain actors, including downstream manufacturers that have started to invest in climate smart agriculture. And this reminded me of another thing that investors could be asking companies is whether they've been uh, conducting climate scenario analysis. And in that process, um, for any company sourcing cocoa, uh, the physical effects of climate change on cocoa production should definitely be of consideration. And in fact, in some cocoa growing regions, uh, this has already started to impact cocoa production in terms of the prevalence of diseases um, that are increasing. So definitely something that uh, should be considered in climate scenario analysis and will definitely become an increasing problem going into the future in this supply chain. Great. Thank you so much, Nako. Well, thank you to all of our speakers for your the really rich content you brought to us today. And, and thank you to our participants for your engagement and the great questions that we had coming in. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to address them all, but um, thank you so much. So please note that you will receive a follow-up email with a recording of this session um, if you'd like to share it or, or watch it again. And to keep updated on Ceres' work and upcoming webinar sessions, please visit series.org. So thank you all and have a wonderful day.